Welcome back to What If Geography. Uh, if you are, this is part two of our episode on, you know, what if there was no plastic? What if plastics had never been invented? What if it had never been invented? And, you know, as we have learned from part one, which we'll get into a little bit of a recap, um, I think it would be, the world would be quite different. Um, we're going to explore a lot more of that today. That's right. Um, and it should be a pretty fun and exciting episode. I know I had a lot of fun in the last last episode to start peppering in questions and sort of my own experiences with plastic, but everybody has their own experiences because it's so pervasive in, in society. Yeah. This feels like a little bit different than some of our other episodes in yeah. terms of, you know, what if something had never been invented before instead of what, what if something had never happened before or what if we had something that we don't have. Mm -hmm. Um, so a little bit of a different take on things. Yeah. But I think, so I think if you go back to episode, our very first episode, which is now like a few months old. Yeah. Several um, months old. Several months old. Yeah. Um, I've been doing this for a little while. Uh, I, I remember distinctly saying, you know, like, you know, as we're like just talking about sort of what this podcast is, is about, it's like, why geography? And it's like, well, because geography is really everything. Like, right? We can always talk about something in sort of a geographic That's frame. Right. That's right. <laughs> Mine. It's a, it, geography is really a way of seeing, framing, understanding the world yeah. more than it is uh, the state capitals. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I, so I guess with that, we'll, let, what, let's do our introductions. That's Hunter. right. I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I'm co-author of Portlandness, a cultural atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas, of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, co-authored by David Bannis. Yeah, and my name is Jeff Gibson, uh, co-host of this podcast as well. Uh, and you can find me on YouTube uh, at Geography by Jeff. In fact, chances are you're here because you originally saw my uh, channel on YouTube, which has uh, been a lot of fun to create videos for. And that's sort of what how we got this podcast. This, this, podcast this came out yeah. of the YouTube channel. Spun right on out. Yeah, um, probably plastic involved somewhere in there. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's no question. Uh, no, but. Um, you can find me there. You can find me on Substack, you know, Geography by Jeff. You can just Google it at this point. Um, I'll do more advanced pluggables, um, you know, at the end here. And, and also, I, you know, I meant to mention this at the beginning of uh, last week's episode as well. But uh, if you're ever interested in just finding us, you know, having a really quick, quick and easy way to find us, just click on the show notes of whatever app you're using. I mm. drop a bunch of links in there. You can find the Substack. You can find uh, uh, Hunter's books. You can find whatever. Um, you don't need to actually remember this. Right. From like, you know. Your app has show notes, so look That's at this. Right. Check it out. <laughs> um, and so before we get to uh, our recap, let's do uh, another quick uh, couple of housekeeping things. So uh, just the first, you know, I'm trying to, you know, get people to review us on Apple Podcasts. So uh, if you like this podcast, you enjoyed the first episode, you're enjoying sort of what we're talking about, go and rate us. Let us know. Let us know. Yeah. Um, it's fun to see, you know, when we get another sort of, you know, review there. Um, and then the second part is is that we are we are still trying to pull together these uh, sort of broader concept of sort of ask a geographer series um, that we're going to sort of pepper in throughout the year, depending on the cadence of you know however often we get good questions. If you do have a question that you think we would be good at answering, or you just want to hear us answer, uh, go to whatifgeography.com. There's a well, one you can listen to the episode from there too if you want. Uh, but just below that uh, little player is a little form you can fill out. And you can drop a question in there. We don't even ask for your name or email if you don't want to give it to us. Yes, yeah, no. We'll Only just, if you want to reply, really. <laughs> and if we get a, a small list of these, that could that could form an episode. Right, and, that, well, and that's the, the intent, right? It's like, you know, it's really fun to create these episodes ourselves. Um, I, I, in, in case anybody's curious, it's a lot of work that Hunter and I put into each episode <laughs> as we do a lot of research into each individual topic. Um, and so this could be kind of like a fun way to sort of have an episode without um, needing to put as much effort, as much research into it. Right. Sort of um, some morsels, some morsels. Yeah. And they don't have to be framed as what if either, you know, whatever, right. whatever, whatever yeah. ge geographic thing you want to talk about, you know, broadly, you know, we try and stick to the what if for our main episodes, but whatever we can be flexible that's right it's our podcast and we'll we can do what we want with it <laughs> that's that we can um and so with that um yeah let's go ahead and do a quick recap well when we, we were last talking jeff we were talking about the history of plastic we talked a little bit about uh how you know the word plastic means something that's pliable or easily shaped and that speaks to the real advantage of plastics inexpensive durable it can be made into almost anything, shaped into almost anything. It can be made in any color. Uh, 
Um, but then also there's the sort of dark side of plastics, which is its meanings that are associated with something that's maybe cheap or inexpensive or fake or superficial. Um, and so that's the way we sort of set everything forward. Talked about the difference between natural polymers and synthetic polymers. So remember, plastics were invented to replace things that had already occurred in nature. And this would have been ivory or silk, rubber, uh, wool, amber, shellac, these various substances that people were using to make things and then decided, well, maybe we can go into a laboratory and make something uh, that can be, you know, we won't have to harvest uh, right. ivory or, or wool or all these kinds of things. Let's see if we can do something more industrial. Yeah. yeah. And, and mm -hmm. industrialization was a big part of our conversation as well is that the plastic industry arises with the sort of classic era of industrialization and the rise of consumer society. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So as people sort of become middle class, they're able to sort of buy things that they want instead of make things that they want. And uh, industrialization plays a big role in this. And also plastics, you know, certainly today, a huge part of the consumer uh, economy. That's right. That's right. Uh, we talked about the early human made plastics, which are semi synthetics, uh, parkesine, celluloid. And, you know, this was, these were things that were invented, but weren't really made and viable for mass production yet. Right? Okay. And so, but that came along in the 1900s, early 1900s. We had Bak Bakelite, uh, 1907, which is something that is generally re uh, regarded to be the first true plastic, the first fully synthetic resin or plastic. Uh, a polymer created entirely in a lab and uh, people, you know, they, they start making things out of it. They start making telephones and radios, things that we know about today. Um, but Bakelite was the kind of plastic that can't be melted down and, and turned into something else. And so we start to get into a conversation about thermoplastics, mm -hmm. which are materials that can be melted down and recreated into something else. We talked about the important role of some early chemical and oil companies, including Dow, ExxonMobil, DuPont, BASF, that were early and are still major players in the plastics in uh, right. industry. Excuse me. I think just going like, you know, Particularly ExxonMobil, right? They're you know often seen as sort of a the big baddie of you know certainly of climate change, right? Um, and that, again, that's a whole other episode that one day we're we're going to explore more more in depth. Um, but I think it, it is worth pointing out that you know a lot of the things that you're using today and are possible today is also because of these companies. Which is not to I'm not I'm not trying to. Um, uh, this is just apologize for the I'm not, I'm not, this is just the case it's just the case it's it's interesting to to see and hear um, about really the absolute global mammoth impact that some of these companies have had in shaping the world that we live in today that's right if you are wearing any clothes that have some nylon in them then dupont was involved in yeah. in that if and dupont you, are they still are they, are they still an independent company or, or are they part of some other they i have no idea i don't know. I mean, I know it was a big family company for a long like time. Monsanto got bought out. I know yeah, that. Yeah, Monsanto doesn't exist anymore yeah. because mm -hmm. that's owned by Bayer. Bayer, right. 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 Yep. Right. Um, we also talked about the importance of the World War II era for plastics uh, in one measure because it was used in part of the war effort for making all kinds of different things, uh, things that people wore, weapons, parts of weapons, this kind of thing. Uh, and then how after World War II, the use of plastics uh, exploded on the scene in consumer society. And all of a sudden, all kinds of things were made out of plastic uh, that could be used once. Single-use packaging, disposable products. Uh, we talked about Tupperware and Saran Wrap and Styrofoam and these kinds of things. Uh, and then it doesn't take long for people to start realizing that there are some environmental issues associated with disposable use of plastics. Right. It's a very disposed, it's created a, a, a society really that's um, become addicted is a hard, a harsh word, but I'm just going to use it anyways, addicted to sort of throw away. Um, yeah. Highly culture. acclimated, accustomed yeah. to that. Yeah. Very accustomed to it. Right. And, you know, even people, and I would say that I, I, do, I do make a very intentional effort to not uh, engage in sort of that throwaway sort of culture. But, you know, you go to, you know, whatever, you buy a bag of chips, right? Um, there's just not any extra use for that bag. That's, it's done. It's Once done. you bought it, it's done, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And and what's interesting is that there, you know, people alive today, right, who were part of 
the society before plastic, not before plastics were necessarily invented, but before plastics became as commonplace and everyday as yeah, they are today. As dominant. Right. So some people have lived through this transition of, you know, I say go back to the 20s or 30s when um, you had to be much more resourceful with the things that you had. You had to recycle, reuse, you know, those kinds of things um, to the post-World War II society in the United States, at least, where disposability became kind of the rule of the day. Right. Yeah. Very important. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely a generation out there that has um, endured a lot of change, <laughs> right? Because this would be the same generation that uh, has broadly seen the automobile become right. dominant, has yeah. broadly seen air travel become possible, has broadly has seen... I mean, this, this, this would be a fast... I'm not sure how we what if this, but <laughs> what a fascinating episode would... You know, for somebody who's 100 years old, what are the changes that have gone on in the life of somebody who is turning 100 in the year 2023, for example? Yeah. That's, that's, that would be fascinating to think about. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, well, not two world wars, right? The first world war was in 1918 or something right. like that. Right, so I mean- so they're not quite that, but they, that's right. they, would, they would remember World War II. Yep. Um, they would, and maybe have some early memories of the Great Depression. For sure, mm -hmm. yep. Um, so those are two monumental global events. That's right. Um, which is a lot. And now they would have also experienced I mean, the I pandemic. I think about the changes of the last 20 <laughs> years and how mind-blowing that is. Um, or going back mm -hmm. several decades. Well, let's yeah, just I mean, let's we, leave it at several decades for me, you know, and, yeah. and what things were like when I grew up. Um, anyways, talking about plastics in the 1960s there is a rise of uh, environmental concern in the 1960s early 1970s and people start seeing uh, plastic waste they start becoming concerned with the chemicals that are being released in the atmosphere in order to make plastic and one of the things as early as the 1960s is that plastic weight uh, waste starts showing up in the oceans right and now today i guess we can launch into sort of Let's uh, do it yeah transition yeah. that you know, one of the things we hear about this, these huge islands of plastic that are in the, the Pacific the Ocean, for Pacific, example. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch or whatever right. it's called. Yeah. And when I first heard about this, I imagined like this big discernible floating <laughs> patch of garbage. Like an uh, island. Right. Like an island <laughs> that there's like civilization is starting on top yeah. of or something like that. Animal species are adapting, but it's not exactly <laughs> like that. Mm -hmm. And what, what we've heard more about is that plastic starts to break down into smaller and smaller parts into what they might be calling microplastics. And that's the big concern now because it's not so much visible by, by the eye always, mm -hmm. but it's starting to become insidious in different parts of the ocean and really having a big impact on ecosystems. Right. And I think, uh, so I think we talked a little bit about this last week, but, you know, plastics don't break down very easily. It can take thousands or sometimes thousands, tens of thousands of years, depending on the plastic. Thousands of years. But what it can do, and this isn't the same thing, but it can break into like really small parts. That's, and that doesn't mean it's gone. That's that right. That doesn't mean it's been, you know, reabsorbed back into the planet right. or the earth or anything like that, that we would commonly associate with like a piece of wood rotting. Right. Um, but instead it just gets smaller. And then that's where we get like, okay, you know, fish are, have a bunch of microplastics in them. Um, whales you know, have a bunch of microplastic in them. All these different things that our ecosystem, our, our, our planet needs for a wide variety of reasons um, are now not poisoned, I guess, but polluted, polluted yeah. with, with microplastics. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. um, and so in response to this rise of plastics and seeing plastic in the ocean, seeing plastic on the roadsides, you know, uh, there are many efforts in the United States in the 1970s to either ban or curb or tax plastic packaging, for example. Okay. That's so, pretty recent, right? Yeah, it was yeah. 1970s. Okay. So, oh, really? Oh, oh, I was thinking like this was like a 20. No, no, no. Thing. This is something that already in the 1970s, or so we think about the first Earth Day, I think was 1970. Does that sound right? Yeah, it sounds somewhere right. around yeah. that time. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, not that that was the moment everybody started thinking about that, but that's where things started to coalesce to the point that people started gathering together and started demanding some kind of action, demanding mm -hmm. some kind of change. And so, you know, there was all kinds of legislation that was proposed but never adopted in the 1970s 
to some of it to ban plastic, some of it to tax it. And the some of the groups that are are worried about this are those that make up the plastic in industry themselves because they're thinking, whoa, right. we're going to get regulated. Um, this is a very cheap way of making things. Mm -hmm. There's a huge demand for it. But if they start to really curtail our ability to do that, that will be bad for business. And so, right. you know, the thinking is, well, what can we do to to stop that? To what can we put out into the into the public realm, into the into the culture, to uh, to stop that kind of initiative from happening? And so, apparently, it's the plastics industry itself that starts to advocate for recycling plastic. There you go. Now you would think that this is Perfect counterintuitive, solution. right? You you think it's <laughs> counterintuitive because if you're recycling something, mm -hmm. then you're not making new product, right? And um, that's you know if you're making new product, you're in the business of making new stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, in the 1970s, as early as in the 1970s, and then into the 1980s, you have some uh, industry associations, mm -hmm. of the plastic manufacturers, who start to advocate for uh, recycling. And I think before we, before we jump into recycling, cause it's going to be, I think a lot, and I'm, I'm definitely gonna have a lot of comments about it and questions. Okay. okay. Um, we're at about an ad break time. Okay. So let's go ahead let's and run, do that. We'll run a quick ad break and then we'll launch back into we'll get back to it. recycling, which is such a fun topic. Here we go. And we're back. The what if geography podcast, we're talking about what if plastics had never been invented before. And we're talking about the rise of recycling. And yeah. the push to recycle plastics that really started in the 1970s and took off in the 1980s. And the fact that the plastics industry itself, the, the industry itself, were the ones who were promoting this recycling effort. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, if you go and look at uh, any sort of plastic container, typically around food containers, but I think it's broadly on a lot of different types of containers, um, you'll see, you know, one, you'll see the little triangle, you'll see That's the little... Right. Um, Recycle triangle, which is like three arrows pointing at each other. Um, and then you'll see a number. That's right. And the number means something, but it doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means. Um, and I, the only reason why I know this is because uh, a close friend of my, mine, uh, a guy named Nick here. Um, hi, Nick. Um, he is deeply into this industry, the sort of the waste, uh, solid waste sort of industry, and has just over the years imparted so much recycling knowledge on me and sort of like really um he he, he likes to call it um he, he takes away people's green feelies mm -hmm. um right people people really like the idea that they're recycling and it's right. like oh i'm helping mother nature well like, recycling when it works is is fantastic yeah i mean it, yeah it can yeah um however what we're talking about is that there's probably the perception of plastic recycling and there's the reality of right. plastic recycling which aren't exactly the same so the the little arrows with the number in it that you talked about those are called resin identification codes okay which yeah. were launched in 1988 okay all right so been that's around. been around the block a couple I'm, times i was going to say recent <laughs> 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 because i'm very conscious of a period of time where that didn't exist yeah. but we're talking about around the time you were born i think so uh, in any case those uh, those suggest that hey it's got a code it can go in my blue recycling right. bin and it can be recycled yeah or or and i've heard this this common refrain it's like um it's um one two and threes are recyclable and please do not take this as advice i'm not about just giving an example well, and is, four fives and six aren't right yeah it's no like, there's but it's it there's a little that. jingle that goes along with that yeah. and i can't remember but it's even more complicated than it's that. more complicated because yeah. it goes by city too right it's like it literally depends on what facilities your locality has That's so right. like your locality might be able to take um you know fives um, others don't. So, I, and I know specifically in Portland um, is one of the few places where you can't drop it in your blue bin, but there is a facility that you can drop your styrofoam off and they will recycle. That's right. There's one outside of town. Yeah, yeah. outside of town. Yeah. yeah, and it like apparently it turns it into jet fuel or something, which right. is like, well, is that really better? I don't know. <laughs> right. Right. I guess that's a good point. <laughs> let's let's just send it up into the atmosphere. I guess. <laughs> but what's important about these resin identification codes and everything is that it indicates that all plastics aren't the same, and if you mix different kinds of plastics together, it's not viable to turn it into something else. They have to be sorted. Yeah, they have to be. Otherwise, to, to have any chance of your ones being with recycled. your ones, your yeah. twos with your twos, yeah. So the, the statistic that I came across several times when I was researching this said that of all the plastics ever created, ever created, mm -hmm. 
that less than 10% of them have ever been recycled. I, I've heard something very yeah. similar, right? So it's most of them are thrown away. Right? Yeah. Um, I've heard that if you, for you know, again, you have your blue bin. If you're mm -hmm. here in Portland, I don't know, a lot of cities I think use blue bins. Um, we're here in Portland, we have a big old blue bin. We, throw all of our recycling in there. The color blue is not incidental here cuz yeah. that's like it's it's, it's the earth. color of of water. It's, it's water. The color of it's fun. It's natural. Yeah. yeah. Um but if you throw from what I've heard uh, even here in Portland a pretty progressive city, you know, thinks thinks of itself as being very, you know, quote unquote green. I've heard a very similar statistic that um, most people's blue bin material actually goes to the landfill. <laughs> that that may be the case. And so there was an NPR and PBS uh, Frontline both conducted an investigative report, and there's some articles about this that you can track down. And these reports suggest um, that the oil industry promoted the idea that plastic recycling was viable when they effectively knew it probably really wouldn't work. Classic oil industry. Right? <laughs> so, and the reason it doesn't really work is because it's not really economically viable. First of all, it's very difficult to collect and difficult and expensive to collect, mm -hmm. to sort, and then to melt down plastic. That's expensive. And making new plastic is cheap. So recycling plastic, you know, when we think about recycling, we think of that, that we're maybe saving resources, we're maybe saving money in some ways. But when mm -hmm. it comes to plastic, it's actually more expensive to recycle plastic, apparently, in most cases, than it is to just create something new. Yeah. Well, and I think generally people have this idea of like, okay, you have a, a plastic Coke or uh, Pepsi bottle, right? Very common. I think a lot of people think when they're thinking about this idea of recycling, it's like, okay, well, we're going to put this into this system where they're going to take this same bottle and they're just going to refill it up with soda. Right. That's not what that happens. Not what happens. Yeah. <laughs> no. You know, on a good day, maybe it gets turned into a park bench or something right. like that, or part of a running track. But, and, and it's great that that technology exists and that can happen. But mm -hmm. I think there's a perception that that's a very common turnaround and in fact, I think that's more the exception than the rule. Right. And so, you know, what NPR and PBS Frontline sort of concluded that the push to advertise recycling plastic was largely done to boost the public image of plastics in the plastic in industry. That's really a marketing tool more than anything else to make people feel okay about buying plastic because they figure, hey, if it can be recycled, what's the big deal? Right. I think this would be uh, maybe analogous to the effort to create uh, you know, you know, gasoline fuel out of corn and ethanol, right? Right. The idea is that, oh, well, we can sort of now build us this natural um, element, you know, or it's, or it's being made more naturally and therefore it's, you know, better and greener and everything like that. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, okay. So if 10% if of plastics get recycled, um, sure, that's great. That's better than no, no, that's none being recycled. For sure. Um, but there's still a heavy cost to the environment during that process of recycling, as well as that it's just not as much as sort of maybe that industry wants us to believe. Right, and if we continue to use things in a disposable way, we're really not getting the root to the root of the problem, which right. is the fact that we're, it's not that we're, people have to consume things, right? I mean, you have to, but the manner in which you consume things is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And consuming things that can't be used again is, is the issue we're talking about. So, 1980s is when plastic recycling really takes off. We have the identification codes in 1988. And by the 1990s, what develops is a global plastic waste trade industry where plastic waste starts to be shipped around the world. And a lot of times it's shipped from places like the United States or maybe se several countries, and you know, for example, in Europe or something like that. And it's brought to other countries. And one of the countries that was receiving an enormous amount of plastic oh, for several decades is China. China. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Very, very famously, like was the, like, I think I had heard the world's like, um, the, the world's garbage can being tossed around it. It's a pretty harsh assessment, but, but yeah, the yeah, idea like, that yeah. they were willing to accept this, mm -hmm. um, up until a certain point, because I think it was 2017, maybe 2018, where China began highly restricting plastic waste imports. Right. And I think from what I had read during that time, again, you know, I have, I have my, my buddy who works in this industry, um, and sort of, he, he had said that, well, I think it was twofold. One, I think China wanted to sort of graduate from this sort of era of development of theirs where they were no longer this country that did that. But I think the other element was that, and this, again, um, coming from my buddy was that a lot of what we were sending over there was, was just 
purely just garbage. It wasn't yeah. actually recyclable. Right. And again, if things are too mixed together, you know, the, the, the best way to sort plastic effectively is by people, human power, and that mm -hmm. becomes expensive and difficult, onerous work. And so now that there isn't the global market has been transformed in the last several years, there's still countries who are accepting this, but there's it's harder and harder to find a market mm -hmm. for uh, for plastic waste. And it's it's interesting that in one of these NPR articles I read, the they, they highlighted one of the recycling facilities, which happened to be in Southern Oregon. Naturally. Right. <laughs> and, you know, the individual who's in charge of the the of the plant said that, you know, yeah, we can find, we can recycle a lot of these other materials because there's a demand for this, mm -hmm. but there's really no demand domestically and, and less and less globally for plastic waste because it's expensive to deal with. It's, it's expensive to transform to something else. And, you know, just as a reminder, even plastic that can be recycled can be recycled maybe once or twice, and then it degrades to the point of not being usable again right so it's not that it can be used over and over yeah. again that's not the case yeah which is interesting i mean not to get into the chemistry too much of it because neither of us are chemists um but I'm, I'm i'm curious you know what specifically about that process of you know i guess melting it down and then resolidifying it how does that and, and there's 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 got to be some sort of fundamental breakdown of the um molecules or something in there i'm not sure again there's people listening who are like i know the answer to this <laughs> yeah i know there's always there's i know there's, there's always that person who's like well you guys are like 50 50 here so yeah but again we're generalists here and so we're trying to bring you the the, the information we have mm -hmm. um but most of what we talk about in these podcasts are are things we've had to research and, yeah. and bring our own knowledge to and, and we're not necessarily experts in uh, they're, you know, talking about recycling or talking about efforts to make plastic more viable. There has been research on bioplastics, for example. Okay. So making uh, plastic from plant crops instead of fossil fuels, um, such as corn, mm -hmm. cornstarch, this kind of thing. Um, there are, this has been innovated to a certain degree. I What I don't understand is whether that's too expensive or if there's not enough political will among the industry. Uh, but this certainly hasn't taken off, which is not to say that it couldn't take off. But again, we have to circle back to your point where if we're still just disposing of things after using them once, we're still not really addressing the main problem. Right. And again, I think maybe it was last week that we talked about this, but I brought up the example of the plastic cup that you would get from, you know, Starbucks, like an actual, like it looks like plastic. Again, usually for their iced beverages and you know, typically, at least here in Portland, the ones here in Portland, what you would see on that is like a little like, you know, Earth logo and it says this, you know, cup is compostable. And again, my, my, my buddy in the industry hates those. He's like, they're not compostable. Those, do not put those in your compost bin, put them inside your garbage because that's not what that's that right. means. Um, There's a lot of wishful recycling, but what that effectively does is compromises the ability of stuff that can be recycled to be recycled. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, again, I think it just lends itself to this, you know, idea of, okay, it sounds better. It sounds like it's better for the planet compostable. Yeah. I love it when things compost and like, you know, returns to its natural state and like, you know, whatever, but the word has almost been co-opted, right? It's been right. co-opted by an industry that probably, you know, maybe there's a little bit of truth in there, but. I'm sure there are individuals involved who are thinking, yeah, we can make this work, but mm -hmm. they didn't really have the technology to do it or the economic ability to do it. They pushed forward with it in hopes that that would materialize. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it really hasn't. Right. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's think about, we've already talked a lot about a lot of the things that we have that are made of plastics, but let's review that a little bit and then launch into sort of an extended discussion of what if plastics never All existed. All right, let's do it. So some of the things that we have because of plastics is a lot of our clothing right. involves plastics, mm -hmm. right? So if you're wearing shoes right now, mm -hmm. there's a good chance that there's plastics involved in that, right? Because yeah. not everybody's wearing all leather construction shoes. No, That's I would not say very few people, yeah. right? I mean, there's some people who maybe, but so... Like the leather worker who's listening to this. Now. Right. It's like, yeah, it's like what are you talking about? Shoes. I wear leather shoes every day. <laughs> But if you go to a major outfitter of footwear, yeah. there's going to be, a, for example, 
or, or any of the competitors mm -hmm. there. You know, yeah. Adidas, we could go down the line. You know, there's a lot of plastic involved in that. And a lot of our clothing. So it, maybe it's 100% cotton, mm -hmm. right? Uh, although there's probably been plastic involved in producing that cotton in some ways. But uh, a lot of our clothing has is plastic in it. Or, yeah, and, and you know, again, like you might, your t-shirt might be 80% cotton, but then it's probably, you know. But the part that's rayon or right. nylon or whatever. <laughs> exactly is yeah. not yeah. yeah or like you know your socks which are you know probably pretty stretchy right um cotton not that stretchy I right think. i mean there's some big <laughs> benefits to this again it's it's no point in just railing against something that mm -hmm. we all use oh, and the reason yeah. we use it is because there's some real benefits to it uh what else are plastics used for packaging is a big one and it's 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 pretty easy to rail against packaging however one of the big concerns we have in the world is food waste mm -hmm. right and plastics tend to keep things preserved better than putting it in glass which is heavy and other mm -hmm. things and there's probably other examples uh, other materials that could be used so i don't want to rule that out but a lot of the packaging that we buy our food in involves plastic and then maybe you put it in a plastic bag and if you don't get a single-use plastic disposable bag you get a multi-use plastic <laughs> bag which is still made out of plastic still made out of plastic so yeah. packaging is a big part of if that if i can rail against one company though okay um, this is hard for me to do because i love them but trader joe's um, oh boy there wow. goes the sponsorship from know, trader right? joe's <laughs> sorry um well and i know they they know this criticism that i'm not about to lay on them um if you go into their store which you know i'm sure you have hunter i go to trader yeah. joe's you go into their produce department and it's like here's some zucchinis that are wrapped yep. in plastic here's your you know broccoli it's all wrapped in plastic for you it's like everything that they they've gone above and beyond and just wrapping everything in plastic right beforehand. but i will say the, <laughs> the like, reason yes. for doing that is because if they didn't that a lot of that food would go to waste a lot but, more of the food would go to waste but then so like you go into like fred meyer okay um, or safeway or something right. and like all of their produce is not automatic that's true that's so, true um I'm sure it's a it's a, just a difference in their logistics and where they're getting right where they're sourcing their items, but that could be a big part of it, right? Which they, is we get into discussion about regional production, yeah. maybe, yeah. And they do know. I've I've seen articles, you know, whatever, um, you know, where people have like brought up the issue to Trader Joe's, and they're like, oh, we're always assessing sort of how we can right. reduce our use of plastic in our, in our materials, and I'm like, great. Now let's start unwrapping our your apples. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember talking, I was talking to somebody who was, I believe this person's position was um, in charge of, you know, renewable, reusable sort of environmental mm -hmm. type things for, I think it was um, either New Seasons or Whole Foods. I think it was New Seasons. Okay. In any case, what this person told me was that their biggest, their customer's biggest concern environmentally is the use of plastic. Right. That's the big concern. But from their perspective, the biggest concern is food waste. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Right. And that, that, well, there's a profitable, profitability market. There's profitability as well, mm -hmm. but there's an enormous amount of energy that goes into producing food as well. So mm -hmm. when you're wasting point. food, you're wasting energy in a lot of ways as yeah. well. And the energy that went into that and the land that went into that is not serving anything. Yeah. So, um, again, take, you know, we're not advocating necessarily one position or the other, but we're trying to put on the table the different aspects of this debate and for people to sort that out on their own. So right. again, we could talk we could talk about packaging more. Let's talk about some other uses. Plastics are absolutely instrumental in the development of computers, cell phones, and many aspects of technology. Oh yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the plastics that are used on sort of motherboards, you know, mm -hmm. and also in electrical wiring. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I have firsthand experience because um, I've done a little, little of my own electrical work. Um, and basically, if your house is done well, <laughs> it's not a fire hazard. All of your wires that are coursing throughout your house are encased in plastic. All of them. Yeah. Um, I just had to do a big rewiring job um, for a new outlet. And, and, it, and, you know, in a lot of ways, it's kind of nice, right? It, right? it insulates the electricity. You know, you can sort of touch that plastic part and not have to worry about. That's right you know, getting shocked, even if there is a live ground. And the, and the chance of be, your but, house burning down is a lot less. It's a lot less, right? Which means the chance of your neighborhood's right. houses burning down. Because old, older houses that haven't had their wires redone, that's basically just copper wires going through through your house, as far as I know. Right. Well, And then, you know, if they were using, what was it? I can't remember from the last episode, but, um, you know, resin or shellac or something like that in order to encase mm -hmm. them, that also becomes very limited because... Right. 
So there's a lot of technology that we use, uh, even if it's not made out of plastic, which a lot of it is, the wires are coated in plastic. And a lot of that is for safety reasons. Yeah. Many advances in medicine use plastic, right? So right. artificial hips and artificial joints and all kinds of different things, uh, preserving medications. Plastics are pretty, in a lot of devices. I mean, they're pretty instrumental in, in medicine. I think I was thinking of the IV bags. For example, yep. Just like a little plastic bag, just sitting there like That's right. pumping this very necessary vital liquid into you. That's right. <laughs> um, Space suits. Would be okay. pretty tough to make That'd without pretty, plastic. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I guess there might be a way of using silk and glass and something like that. Yeah. But I think that a lot of the innovations that have been done outside the atmosphere in space, um, you know, there wouldn't be any spacewalks or mm -hmm. movies about that uh, if, <laughs> yeah. if it weren't for plastic. Um, well, I think that goes, goes to just, again, back to the not only the durability of plastics, but it's malleability. That's right. Right. So, like, yep. You know, again, you, you mentioned like maybe you can have some sort of sort of fine glass, you know, thing, but would that be durable enough or be able to withstand any sort of like minor accident? Because um, glass, you know, can be pretty strong, but also can also be pretty fragile. That's right. Um, relative to a lot of things, right? It can shatter and now you no longer have that thing. <laughs> a lot of forms of transportation use a lot of plastic. So mm -hmm. it's not that your car is made entirely out of plastic because it's not, right? But there's a lot of plastic involved. And if... Planes, trains, and automobiles, I'm thinking mostly automobiles and planes at the moment, but if they were made out of all non-plastic, they'd be a lot heavier mm -hmm. and you'd have to use a lot more a lot fuel. More fuel. Yeah. Now, I don't know what the equation is as to whether <laughs> there's more fuel used into making the plastic that goes into them or if there's more fuel that would be consumed in a vehicle that doesn't have any plastic, but that's just a consideration that we have to throw on the table. Right. I mean, I think it's just, it, it brings up the interesting questions of, um, you know, we like to paint broad brushes, you know, that you know, are black and white, right? And it's like, right. well, you know, and I think every episode that we've ever sort of talked about any sort of issue on our podcast, it's always like, well, it's it's a series of grays, right? right. And it's yeah. never going to be one or the other. Right. There's always some sort of... There's a lot of nuance. Nuance and other effects going into it. Well, I think we should get into the what ifs because that we're sort of already sort of doing that. So what do you think? Yeah, we can do, uh, you know what? Because we're almost at ad time, I yeah. feel like we should just go ahead and get that out of the way. Okay. That way we don't have to interrupt you, listener, and we can just, just sort of go for just it. Just go for it. Yeah. All right. And you get the rest of the episode of What Ifs. Let's do it that way. <laughs> right. uh, we'll be right back. All right. And we're back. Uh, hopefully, you listen to some ads and, yeah, hopefully, you just listen to some ads. Um, <laughs> we're going to continue on with uh, our exciting conclusion. We built up a lot to this point where we're going to talk a lot about. The what ifs of round plastic, Hunter. That's right. Well, I have a long list of what ifs here. This is going to be fun. And one of them I'm is, and, and, and this is the one that's harder to ascertain, and we were just sort of talking about that, is there would be less fossil fuel used probably because there's so much fossil fuel that goes into the creation of plastics. Mm -hmm. And of course, this would have an impact on climate change, but this is very difficult to, to assess, I think. Um, so there would be some change in demand for fossil fuel without plastics. Yeah. Well, I think my first reaction to that is that it showcases just how much oil we actually have on this planet that, you know, we typically think of, um, fossil fuels as going into, you know, powering our vehicles and our planes and mm -hmm. trains and automobiles. Um, but there's this whole other industry, which also consumes a vast a quantity of this, you know, resource this fossil fuel resource, um, where if you were to take that away, you know, before the, the ad break, you were talking a little bit about, okay, well, if we didn't have plastic, you know, we would have heavier vehicles. That's right. So there's some equation there. It's like, okay, you know, it's not a one for one. It's not like you're just taking away right. all this. How does that wash out? Um, we're not really yeah. sure, but the industry would be changed. Right. And a lot of these, what ifs involve industries that would look very different. I think, uh, one of the things I think we could, that would probably be the case without plastics is that the oceans would probably be much healthier. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, well, I guess we, we already talked about the, the ocean. We've talked about the great, you know, garbage patch. We talked about microplastics and everything. I think all of this, I don't even think we fully understand yet how the impact of these microplastics on 
our oceans or even on us and our own bodies. Think of how new it is, really, if we're thinking about really the 1950s and 60s is when they started being introduced and then they start breaking down. Mm -hmm. So not enough time has passed for us to really have a good sense. But, you know, there's there's good reason to be concerned. Yeah, I think there's um, some statistics floating around out there that you you human listening to this right now, uh, you actually do have microplastics inside you. Um, and I think it makes sense too, because even if it's not, so, you know, I think things that get thrown into the ocean, they break down in there. Um, but we also use a lot of plastics in various things that on our daily lives, right? Um, your shampoo bottle um, is probably plastic. Your toothbrush is gonna be plastic. Uh, you're drinking out of plastic uh, bottles. Um, if not often, then at least occasionally, mm-hmm. there's all these different things where um, we might not even notice, but just very small amounts of plastic sort of get worn off by some sort of chemical, or maybe it's just water and now it's going into your body, right? Um, so bodies of water would be healthier. Bodies of water would be healthier and, and bodies be, of humans would probably right, be healthier. Right, right. No, they wouldn't be completely <laughs> healthy, but probably healthier than they are now. Also, there would be probably less chemical pollution in the air. Interesting. Okay, because the, um, the factories that make plastic are pretty pollutant right um, and then there's the co2 that goes along there's with a creation. co2 that goes along with that yep. so then that, that even has like wider impacts of okay um if there was no plastic which again this is a mammoth industry that's you know right permeated the, advocating the elimination of plastic right. it's a what if there it's wasn't if, yeah. that's right um, but it's just a it's a mammoth industry that's you know global um a lot of plastic gets made it's not just like one place and you know wherever um do, you know i think there's a question there again we don't we don't know of the total um, amount of CO2 emissions that are emitted by the plastic industry, although I'm sure that stat exists out there. But, you know, does that change the equation for where we are right now with global uh, global climate change? Right. Um, maybe maybe there's yeah. there's something there. Maybe, um, you know, we're a little bit better off in that regard. There'd also be a lot less pollution on land in addition to the water and air. Right. And so, I mean, every aspect of. Uh of the world plastic has contributed to pollution and so that's that has been one of the big concerns and that would probably be one of the big changes Mm -hmm. if if there weren't um plastics but there's also a bunch of things to consider that sort of more in this in-between thing that you might not be thinking about for example some species of animals Mm -hmm. like elephants some turtles rhinos would be endangered extinct already probably with that plastic if you oh. consider the rate at which ivory and tortoise shell was being used, yeah. uh, either that or they'd be farming these animals or something like that, which also might be a possibility. But um, that's, and again, we're speculating here, mm-hmm. but th- you know, there's still demand for ivory, of course. Right. But the demand for ivory without plastic would be even more. Yeah, no, because you, so we talked about this last week, um, sort of how a lot of these early materials that plastic eventually replaces comes from these very sort of natural you know creatures you know, that's like right said, from uh, animals ele- elephants or from and, plants and tortoiseshells yeah and what, have, what have you um and yeah i think there's a very distinct possibility just knowing humans and sort of how we human um that we would turn that into an industry or we would use it until there's no longer an industry right. there entirely in which case you know maybe there's a weird uh what if uh, scenario here where um you know just like very minor but you're piano keys are now iron or something. Right. Yeah, I don't know what that would look like. But yeah, instead of tickling the ivories, right? Um, more There would be, without plastic, there would be a lot more harvest of wood and rubber among other natural materials. And so that there's already a concern, uh, uh, you know, in cork and these kinds of things mm-hmm. that these, the harvesting of, of these resources, or maybe we should just call them aspects of the natural environment, they would be only increased without plastic. Now, again, that's not saying that there would be a net positive or negative or anything, but that's probably the case. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because it's almost like a a what if in not just, um, you know, what wouldn't exist today, but what what wouldn't necessarily exist tomorrow, too. Right. And and the the reason why I brought that up is because, you know, we've used wood historically for a lot of our buildings. um, Right. Like I'm in a wood frame house. and then we've used steel um, in a lot of our bigger buildings. That's right. Um, but now we're getting to this point where there's a new sort of technology that's come out, which is um, it's called cross laminated timber. Okay. Which is a timber um, that they've, you know, infused with some sort of plastic, you know, something or other. 
that makes it really you know much more durable so that you can build you know up to like 10 or 15 stories with just a wood frame building yep. so it's a lot more efficient it's you know still wood so there's there's a lot of aspects of that it's like okay this could be a really good way to build up our cities you know without having to use the um the the steel industry or, or something that's you know a lot more resource intensive um and without plastics that probably wouldn't exist mm -hmm. yeah I, the way in which we clean and store water and ensure water supplies would be different without plastic. Right? One of the main ways which water is delivered to people in emergency situations uh, is in plastic bottles, for yeah. example. And you can put plastic, you can put water, I'm sorry, in other things like glass, but then it becomes difficult, more difficult, more heavy to, to transport and it breaks. It's not as durable yeah. and things like that. So um and and it's heavier to transport it's probably use more emissions right? more energy to get from place to place and if you're storing water for an emergency situation like an earthquake mm -hmm. and it's stored in glass bottles mm -hmm. and there's an earthquake you know the plastic bottle might survive in the way that glass wouldn't again this is not trying to be apologizing for plastic but it's to suggest that there's some very real uses for it that this is the moment to consider what those are um, without plastic to line wires, electricity would probably present a lot more dangers and there would probably be more fires. Yeah. I mean, there would probably be, I mean, to be honest, there would probably be less electricity in general. Yeah. Right? I think that's fair think, to say. Yep. You know, again, if you look at any sort of modern built house today, um, whatever, um, there's plugs everywhere. Uh, it's just your house is wired to the, to the gills. Right. Um, but I, in fact, there's even... There are even laws that say there have to be at least a number of outlets. There, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas if you go into an older build house uh, that hasn't been remodeled, um, I think there are fewer outlets. And you know, I think part of that might have just been the demand, right? If you have a house right. that was built in the early 1900s, right. people weren't imagining that there would be a TV and a computer and like a cell in phone, every room, and, you know, yeah, refrigerator and all this kind of stuff that needs all this power. But I think also a large part of that might might have been because okay, more wire, you know, more chances for exposure more chances for combustion. Yep, yeah. absolutely. So let's consider some of the industries that would be very different without plastic. Certainly the medical industry would be very different without plastic. It would be much harder to keep things sterile without plastic gloves, syringes, blood storage packaging, tubing, dialysis machines, medical implants, all kinds of medical equipment. Plastic has been helpful in that regard for sterility, uh, you know, keeping things clean and for um, innovations as well. Yeah, and probably keeping it, well, <laughs> we in the United States don't have exactly the cheapest healthcare. No, we don't. That's another <laughs> That's episode. That's a whole other episode. Uh, there's probably a much more complicated answer for why it's so expensive here, but you have to imagine that- It would like, be even more be expensive. even more expensive, right? Because right. if, you know, I mean, it's just, Plastic is so easy to just replicate various items. You can have almost, and then this is probably one of the few instances where inside a medical environment, having a single use item, you know, is beneficial, right? Because the, otherwise there's bacteria spread, there's, you know, there's too much contamination spread, potential, potential contamination spread, I should say, um, that plastics enable there to not be, because mm -hmm. you can just right into the garbage can. That's exactly yeah. right. Uh, the clothing industry would be very different. Without the synthetics, without nylon, polyester, anybody who wears vinyl, you know, these kinds of things wouldn't be available. And so what does that mean? Well, we would probably have an increase in cotton production. I'm guessing that's probably. a possible thing, which would take up a lot more arable land and water and the inputs that we use to grow cotton. And you know, it's interesting. I think um, not only would there be more cotton production, so you know, obviously there's a geography behind that, right? I think we already grow a lot of cotton. Um, in this country, we talked a little Texas, bit about sort of, lot yeah, of, yep. in our, in our, what if the Southwest runs out of water episodes, goes back to our very first episodes that, um, you know, places like Arizona and Texas have, you know, a lot of cotton production. Um, so we would need even more of that. But I also wonder, okay, if we have to rely on, you know, natural materials, does, um, something like silk become much more, um, popular and much more used amongst, you know, various, you know, people who want That's something a little more comfortable. Probably more. the case. Mm -hmm. And so there would probably be a lot 
there would be a lot more mulberry trees grown. <laughs> more mulberry trees. There. Right, to create more mulberry mm -hmm. leaves for the silkworms, which apparently are actually caterpillars and turn into moths. Um, and then probably wool. Probably wool, right? yeah. Right, so that means wool. there would be even more sheep in the world, probably, a lot more land dedicated to sheep, sheep ranges, because this, I mean, this was one of the industries that catalyze industrialization in the yeah. first place and actually this is really interesting because i think there's there's a couple different sides to this right so if if there's no plastics which means there's no clothes which means means they have to you know cotton silk and now wool becomes mm -hmm. much more dominant um you know in the u.s wool and sheep is not a big part of sort of our everyday agriculture it's that's right highly you know chicken and cows cattle. right um and and swine and, and swine um, but if sheep became sort of the dominant because there was this dual need for it, right? It could serve as food as well as um, um, this fabric. Right. Um, does that then supplant maybe cattle industry? Well, it, hold on. Except that one of the other things that we would probably need a lot more of is leather. Oh, because, <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> because most shoes you know, aren't made from silk right. or wool. <laughs> That's true. Um, they're, they, you know, they'd be made from leather. So and so you probably cattle. actually need much more cattle to yeah. produce the leather that would be needed because there would be no pleather anymore right it all right. would all be actual leather yeah um and so that would transform that industry as well so we had, it's not it's not a either it's not a you know sheep or cattle it's a more sheep and more cattle and silkworms i mean i'm <laughs> more silkworms. this is the what if and that's mm -hmm. what i'm thinking maybe would be the answer uh you know, we talked a lot about how modern warfare would be very different as well. And so it would be more similar to pre-industrial warfare. I mean, certainly we'd have some pretty massive weapons and you could make tanks and such without plastic. Um, we talked about on the at last episode that, that Teflon was used mm -hmm. um, in the creation of the atom bomb because they needed it for, you know containing gases and, and insulating, I guess, valves and, and things like yeah. that. Um, so warfare would not be obsolete because it's been around for a long time, but the way that wars play out and the kinds of defense and mm -hmm. weapons that are used, um, again, they might not be completely different, but, but they would be, there would be some change there. Well, yeah. And I think certainly like, it, you know, maybe there'd be a relatively minor change, you know, from World War Two to, you know, you know, World War Two would would look a little bit more basic like World War One. Yeah. Um, but I think today, you know, we have, you know, one, we have drones, right? Right. Uh, drone warfare and drones would simply not exist. We wouldn't have without drones plastic. without plastic. Because, um, yeah, there's so much technology in them and yeah. so much, um, you know, fine, um, durable materials that need to go into That's those right. things. Um, but then you also wouldn't have sort of computer chips, you know, guided sort of all these missiles and, right. you know, these things that can launch something, you know, 10 miles away and sort of hit it within some degree of accuracy. Yeah, I mean, right? you, you might have some of that, but it's, again, because we're bumping up the limits of our knowledge of exactly <laughs> how much plastic is used in, in warfare, but certainly that would be something that would be very different. Um, the food industry to go along with clothing a little bit uh industrial agriculture some would say would be almost impossible without uh without plastic in some ways um that makes sense you know yeah. um i think that many more people would be needed to work as farmers than there are now kind mm -hmm. of like in the past in the pre-industrial era right or in the mid-industrial area there were just more and more people who um, had to work as farmers. Many diets would become more limited. So food that gets transported across halfway across the world, um, some of it, and maybe it's not as viable if you don't have plastic to do that kind of uh, thing. Right. You probably wouldn't be able to get your avocado in Sweden. Right. Yeah. For example, the kiwis that you know you can get from New Zealand and somehow <laughs> pay like fifty cents for. You know. <laughs> the wild globalization effects <laughs> yeah i think that would be the globalization would look differently you know as we mentioned i think before aluminum cans and paper cups are still lined with a thin layer of plastic right oh well we talked about paper cups i don't know if we talked about aluminum cans apparently but, that's yeah. the case really um so there'd probably be more regional less global food production in some ways there would probably be less extensive food chains mm-hmm uh, and for some foods, it wouldn't matter as much. Like the apples and potatoes, it probably wouldn't matter as much. But for some foods, it would matter quite a lot. 
Um, you know, using glass for packaging, as we mentioned before, would be much heavier, more fossil fuel use for transportation of those things. Um, other industries that would be different. The, well, well, we've already touched on the tech industry would be right. differently. And this phone that I have sitting in my hands right, right. now would not exist. The it's microphones that we're speaking in yeah. that are connected to the computers that we're using mm -hmm. to record this wouldn't exist. Um, basically, we'd be living, uh, according to some commentators in the 1870s from an electronics perspective which is wild to think about it's that's it's, basically that i mean there's yeah. like no electronics <laughs> right there's very little things <laughs> it's no computers there's no computers there's no cell phones there's no smartphones yeah that would be which different means there's no what if geography podcast that's right that would be <laughs> and the, some people are thinking oh, it wouldn't be such a bad thing but <laughs> that's the biggest impact right there <laughs> well it's, a, it's at the moment it would be a big impact for us there's all kinds of things that we use for our own enjoyment and recreation that would be completely different. So I'm thinking of the toy industry at the moment. Now, okay. you can have toys without plastic because yeah. there've always been toys, and mm -hmm. but they're made out of wood and different things like right. that. Now, you take someone like myself, who's kind of fanatic about Lego. I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, you know, just come out and come clean and say that. You know, that would, that would not be a thing, right? There's no, <laughs> there's no Lego. <laughs> Without plastic. It's no Lego without plastic. No, yeah. so that's that would be different. And it's interesting because the Lego company started by making wood toys and stuff like that. So oh, there actually, might yeah. be a Lego company yeah. and they might make wooden pull docks like they started making at yeah. the beginning. Um, but there would be, you know, the, the toy situation, there would be no Barbies, yeah. there would be, a, things would be quite a bit well, different. Even, You'd have board games, yeah. you know? Well, even I was going to say your, you know, your football, right? You know, yeah. that used to be made out of like pigskin, right? It's like, right. Oh, it's yeah. pigskin. It's so you, not made out of pigskin anymore. <laughs> right. I mean, you could, but you could have those sports. You they'd be a little them, different. Right? Some they'd things you couldn't have yeah. and some things would be different. Or they'd be more expensive, right? You know, pigskin yeah. football is probably gonna yeah. be a little more expensive than your plastic football. You can buy yep. that. Um, think of how music would be different. No vinyl records. No vinyl records. Yeah. Right. No cassette tapes. No cassette tapes. Now <laughs> you might be thinking, well, I don't listen to music on vinyl or cassette, <laughs> but if you listen to it on Spotify, you wouldn't have that wouldn't either, have either. Right. Yeah, and yeah. so the demand for live music would be a lot more without plastic. I'm thinking. Interesting. No, that's very true. Um, it probably doesn't rank up there as importantly as some of these other things, but you know, yeah. it's a it, music is a very important thing in people's lives. It's what keep, keeps people happy sometimes yes yeah. well and i think there's a discussion here of like how would music be different too right because so much of modern day music um certainly you know within you know pop and hip-hop and you know even rock these days is made yep. by this technology that is um synthesized synthesized that which which comes from things that are made of plastic right yeah you can go back to the you know the 1800s and you can have like a acoustic guitar made that's that's right fine. but you can have a piano right so it's like but new wave would have never happened without plastic, <laughs> right? No for example, wave. yeah, because yeah. those synthetic sounds, right, yeah. from synthesizers, like yeah. we wouldn't have that. We wouldn't have any. And for some people, it's not a big loss. For me personally, that would be a loss. That would right? it would be a huge if loss if there was no yeah. new wave. Mm -hmm. um, no credit cards. Oh yeah. No, that doesn't mean <laughs> credit would disappear, but you know, you would you, you would be using cash yeah. a lot more. That's literally something. That's like uh, there used to be like a saying, like you know, like pull out your plastic or something. Yeah, exactly. Like that, yeah. <laughs> so there's that. I mean, I think, and you know, we're talking about all the different products and mm -hmm. things like that, but I think that culturally there would be, it would be different that the, this culture of disposability that we have today would be less, would I be, think. would be different certainly, yeah. I think. And the value of thrift that we talked about being a characteristic of, at least in the United States of the 1930s and before, mm -hmm maybe you know to world war ii you know maybe that value of thrift would still be higher profile maybe there would be the culture of disposability would be different maybe mm -hmm. we would think about the way that we consume differently without plastic yeah it's interesting because you think about society today and sort of where we're at with our relationship to plastic and you know, i think people are generally uh thinking of plastic as this, as something that's bad Mm -hmm. um, and I think for a lot of reasons, right? Um, for a lot of reasons we've covered today and maybe even some that we haven't even thought of, um, that plastic is bad. And so we've almost seen a shift back for from people um, who want to go and find these antiques and want to find these things that lend itself to maybe a little bit of more of uh, authenticity of item, of object that's, well, this was made by, you know, this is real. 
Yeah. And it goes back we to this idea of like- We live in a steampunk world. Ex- yeah. <laughs> exactly. Right? Which some people are like, hey, I could handle so, yeah, that. A lot right? of people are like, well, sign We're me up for that. putting our energy into like steampunk <laughs> instead of into <laughs> yeah. synthetic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be a cultural shift for sure. But, you know, as we wrap things up here, you know, we've been talking about what if plastic never existed. And that's a very interesting thought exercise as they all are. But of course, in our world, it's not all or nothing with plastic. Right. And so maybe as we wrap up, we can think about, you know, we don't have to think about, you know, all plastic or no plastic. But m- maybe one of these things that comes out of this conversation today and last week is thinking about, you know, what are the moments where plastic are really useful and really important? Mm-hmm. And what are the what are the times that maybe we can pull back a little bit from plastic use? And, right. and you know, that's maybe a takeaway that we could leave people thinking about, which is, you know, it's not all or nothing, but um, and plastics have a very important role in the world. But what are the uses of plastics that we have today that maybe aren't as important or could be substituted? Right. I mean, I think just going back to sort of the healthcare industry, latex gloves, for example. Um, a hugely important use of plastic that has absolutely been monumentally have mo- monumentally changed um, healthcare for the world. In fact, the masks know, that we wear the, during COVID, the masks you know, we, I, you know, I think there's, you know, had plastic not been invented, you know, the, some some of this technology not been invented, would we have as many people and would our life expectancy be where it's at today? That's a very it's, good point. It's a yeah, it's a great yeah. point. It's something to think about, right? That's it's um, so closely tied to the rise of modern medicine yeah, in some ways. It's hard to pull them apart, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, plastics and sort of antibiotics almost go hand in hand. Yeah. Um so there's just a lot there as people were, I think, grasping with the idea of how diseases spread and like sort of starting to understand of like what is it that's causing us to get sick and die. Yep. Um, and so as they figure that out and they figure out, oh, washing your hands is important. And, you know, they figure out, you know, well, we can take antibiotics to kill stuff that's inside of us that's, that's making us ill. And we also have these things that can sort of keep us sterilized and clean while yeah. we're digging around in somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I started researching this or when Eli first suggested to me that this would be a good topic, you know, immediately I start thinking about all the benefits of mm-hmm. not having plastic, right. of which there are many. There are many benefits, yeah. And then I start digging into it and then I think about, well, it's not, it's not just benefits. Right. There'd be some real challenges that we would have. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, life expectancy, yeah. that being different, would that's a big change. Yeah. And I, for one, like recording this podcast. Right. So right. Thank, thank you, Plastic, for allowing that to happen. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it, it, we almost, it, we didn't bring this up before, but, um, and you might not be, aware of the 1967 film, The Graduate, starring Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft. I think I've heard of it. Okay, you've yeah. heard of it. And so for a lot of people listening to this, they're like, click. <laughs> but but for some people listening to this who are maybe my generation or older, there's a scene in that film where it's Dustin Hoffman is graduating from yeah. college mm-hmm. and he's his parents are throwing this, this torturous cocktail party for him where mm-hmm. he's all these... F- his friend's parents are talking like to them and it's it's and, it's really kind of yeah. that moment in the 60s where the counterculture meets the sort of old generation older generation and and um somebody comes up to him and says you know i want to have a word with you and he's like are you listening he's like and dustin hoffman's like i'm listening it's like one word plastics <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? He says, "Yeah, I'll think about it." That's enough. And so that's you know that's that's a, no, there's a very cultural interesting cachet, cultural yeah. moment at the time where, at that time, plastics have already received kind of this bad reputation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, interesting. And it's sort of been crystallized in this moment of, of, uh, of popular culture recorded on. Plastic film. Plastic film. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Well, are we? Are, I think let's, let's run through some pluggables. Yeah. My right. name is Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I am co-author with David Bannis of Portlandness, a cultural atlas, and Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. Jeff. Yeah. And my name is Jeff Gibson. You can find me on YouTube. That's YouTube.com/slash uh, little at sign Geography by Jeff. Or on Substack, geographybyjeff.substack.com. Um, again, you can look at the show notes to get all of these fun little links that you can sort of click on. You don't need to remember any of this. Um, but also, um, do go on to whatifgeography.com and leave us a question if you have one. 
Um, you can see my lovely web design skills uh, made uh, proudly in WordPress. Uh, <laughs> it's actually fine. It looks it looks okay. Um, and uh, please rate us on Apple Podcasts if you like sort of the episode that you just listened to. Yeah, particularly um, if you're it. favorable, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. if they're favorite. Yeah, if they're yeah. If, if you don't like it, maybe just stop listening. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you made it to this point, you know, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> um, um, but otherwise, uh, thanks for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, and we'll see you next week. Or we won't see you, but you'll hear us. Yeah, we'll hear you. You'll hear us next week. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Bye.